let's first of all uh, go back to the question that we had left at, you know, when we were going for break. And in regards to the foods that we were talking about, and at some point in time, you know, there are the, the times when you're told that, yes, uh, when you take this, you're likely to sort of get cancer. You have, you stand, you know, a high risk. Mm -hmm. But then one would ask, is it in the aspect of how much you eat or it's just direct and outright that if you take this, no matter how the portion, you know, you're likely to increase your chances of cancer or high chances of cancer? Um, I would say it's both in the quality and quantity of All what right. you eat. Okay. Uh, in terms of quality, it depends on uh, the nutrient compositions. Mm -hmm. So generally, not just for cancer, mm -hmm. but for even other lifestyle diseases, diabetes, hypertension, and everything else, right. we usually... Uh, advise people to take more of fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Close to about 50% of your diet should come from that class of foods. Right. And then the proteins and carbohydrates should be about 25-25%, mm -hmm. so roughly. All right. And then uh, when it comes to quantity, maybe the link will now come to, in terms of how it relates to uh, obesity, right. and also the quantity of some of these... Uh, high calorie foods and by high calorie foods I mean things that are very high in sugars, mm -hmm. the soft drinks, things such as uh, french fries and that kind of thing. So when you eat them in high quanti uh, quantities you also right. expose yourself to the risk of obesity which in itself is also a risk factor for cancers. Cancer. Yeah. Mm. All right. Mm. Okay, so that is in the aspect of you preventing yourself anyway. As always, we say it's important that we deal with this at the level of prevention. Mm -hmm. But then there are times where it has, crossed, it has crossed the bridge to the other end where uh, officially you've been diagnosed with a sort of cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, before we come to that aspect and understand the kinds of foods that uh, such uh, individuals should take, let's first of all take a look at this week as we celebrate cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. And in according to what uh, my reporter, who of course has reported, uh, you know, there's that aspect where about approximately nine Nine women die of cervical cancer on a daily basis. That is again also according to the studies that have been conducted. Mm -hmm. And uh, making it the most sort of deadly sort of uh, kind of ca cancer or non-communicable disease as it stands today. Even as we celebrate this week, what strides have we made as a people? The latest, of course, we heard of the fact that uh, we've introduced this, uh, you know, sort of vaccine uh, that is introduced to, ch to, to young girls at the age of 10, 10 you know, yeah. moving up. And a majority of people who have not welcomed this, or not really a majority, but a, a section of people have not welcomed this. What do you make of it? And moving forward, how do we get to that point where we can zero this? So uh, when it comes to cervical cancer, the, I think the, the vaccine is actually a game changer for us. In mm. the places where it has been used, particularly in a place like Australia where they started using it in 2007, right. there's actually some hope that they could be perhaps the first country to eradicate cervical cancer. Mm. So cervical cancer by and large is actually a preventable disease and perhaps the only cancer we still have a vaccine for at this point in okay. our history. Mm -hmm. So introducing it to our system should give us benefits that we will see in the next coming decades. Mm -hmm. And th there's been, of course, a lot of controversy surrounding the cervical cancer. Much of it is perhaps based on misinformation right. from my opinion. And the, 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 the vaccine actually works. There has been Places where they've used it, they've seen mm -hmm. cervical cancer reduce. So when it comes to cervical cancer, it's one of the cancers that have a very good outcome mm -hmm. if detected early. Mm -hmm. Most people, if it's found in stage one or the early stages, you'll discover that 90% uh, or thereabouts of them are can be cured completely mm -hmm. of cervical cancer. So it's one of those diseases we should try to encourage people to get screening for because there's actually a benefit to being caught early and treated early. Treated early, that's mm. interesting and, and equally very good. And that mm. aspect of aflatoxin, just looking at, of course, the moments or the steps within the country mm -hmm. and uh, that uh, sort of conversation that was ongoing in regards to, oh, we're not supposed to enjoy our gully as we used to enjoy <laughs> and all that. I mean, mm. having followed up on the same, because I want to believe that, yes, there's been some proper follow-up on the same. How mm. far are we in regards to demystifying this or to sort of just ebbing away this uh, information in terms of whether it's a myth or whether indeed it was the reality on ground? Uh, so uh, unfortunately at an individual level you may never know whether the food you're eating has aflatoxin or, or not, not yes. because you're probably not uh, involved in the production and mm -hmm. supply of it. Mm. 
but uh, for those who are involved in that part of food supply, the food chain, mm -hmm. uh, aflatoxin is, just as the word suggests, it's a toxin, it's a poison. Right. It's, uh, it naturally grows on decaying mm -hmm. food. And so when, con uh, when somebody takes contaminated uh, food that contains aflatoxin, it uh, has the potential to damage their DNA. Yeah. And if such a patient comes to Bliss where I work in the clinic, maybe one of the things they might have is liver cancer. Mm -hmm. Some of them may also develop uh, other immune diseases because it also affects your immunity and also leads to malnutrition. So at an individual level, perhaps we uh, our hands are tied. You mm -hmm. may not really uh, control, control what food yeah, reaches yourself. you. Uh -huh. But the, there are uh, those people in the other side of the production and the supply chain of food uh -huh. who are actually tasked with uh, ensuring this food does not reach the end uh -huh. consumer. And so if we lose it at that point, then we are exposing the population to diseases that they should not have right. and which eventually will cost us as a country in mm -hmm. terms of our resources being used to treat them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.